Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah. I bear witness that Muhammad is his messenger. Beloved brothers and sisters, I greet you with the greeting words of peace. Salam alaikum. Once again, it is my privilege and pleasure to be here at the final call administration building and to be able to look into your faces and to come into your homes by your permission and of course by the permission of Almighty God Allah. Last week, uh, Brother Farrakhan quickly came into the country and then disappeared. I did not want to tell you at that time where I was because I knew that some of you would get very, very excited. But uh, two years ago, I made a commitment to the Navajo and Hopi Indians that on uh, July uh, the 6th, uh, 1986, it was learned that the government of the United States had planned to move uh, the Navajo Indians off of their lands, and I pledged to them that I would be there with them when the government and the soldiers appeared. You may say, Brother Farrakhan, that is very dangerous. Yes, it is. But I am convinced more so now than ever before that there is a power with me that the United States government will soon recognize if they don't already recognize it, and you too will come to recognize it. And I had to be there with uh, the Indians because the United States government is a very murderous government and they will stop at nothing to get their ends. But I believed with all my heart that if I were among the Indians that they would not do anything because uh, if I am just scratched accidentally by you, you will be destroyed completely. I am not boasting, but I am more than what you think I am. And I am more than what I thought I was. But I am here for your salvation and for the damnation of those who are against your rise. Take it or let it alone. When on September the 17th, 1985, Allah gave me a vision in which I was transported by a small circular plane, you call it UFO, to a great mother wheel that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad told us for many years was above our heads. And on that wheel, for the first time in 10 years, I heard the voice of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad from that wheel told me of the United States government's plans to make war against a certain people in a certain place at a certain time. I did not hear in that communication who the people were, where they were, etc. But I can only tell you this, that as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad spoke to me in this vision from that wheel, he spoke in very short cryptic sentences, but whole paragraphs were going off in my brain and I could see writing like a scroll even though I was not able to discern what all the writing was. Which means that much was put into me in that very short meeting that is now coming forward from me. And you don't have to be a scholar or a scientist, all you have to do is observe me. 
I say this to all of you, black and white. You just have to observe me and listen carefully to what comes from my lips and then study what you already know. And if it doesn't lead you to a profound conclusion that something is happening with your brother, through your brother, for your benefit, then you are dead indeed. And I don't believe you are as dead as you might think you are. I believe you already observe, even though you may not understand what is actually going on. Because I myself am growing into the understanding of what is going on, what has been going on, particularly that night of September the 17th with that vision. I'm saying that to say this, that from that time I was conscious of the wheel that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us about. Everywhere I went on my 50,000 mile journey, the wheel went with me. I don't have time on this short broadcast to deal with all the specifics of what I saw, what I heard, but I knew that the wheel was with me in Ghana in Burkina Faso, in Nigeria, in Ivory Coast, in Benin, and it was with me in Libya. I knew that the wheel interfered with the electronic communication of the aircraft carrier that uh, America had there, the Sixth Fleet, in the Gulf of Sirte or the Gulf of Sidra. And that aircraft carrier had to return to Miami for servicing. I understood when Gaddafi shot down three American planes and there was not a responsive answer by all of that firepower in the Mediterranean, there was a power bigger than America's power interfering with America's power. And later it came out in the news that a bright yellowish orange object a wheel-like object was spotted in the Mediterranean. I am telling America that wherever I am, the wheel is. And you had better be very careful how you deal with me. Your end is in sight. This is for Reagan and the whole staff. You have no power today against what I am doing. Remember that. I'm here as a mercy to you or to end your civilization, whichever one you want. Now let me continue. That wheel followed me in the Middle East. It followed me in the Far East. And as I was moving back into America, that wheel followed me on the airplane. I looked out of my window and saw it there. And it began to perform for me, letting me know it was not a star. I am not a drunken man. I am not a nut. I don't speak as one crazy. And I am not one that wants honor from the people. I care nothing about your honor or you honoring or crediting me. I have a job to do in the name of God and in the name of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And I'm on my job. And no one and no power in the heaven above or in the earth beneath will interfere with me in the carrying out of my mission. And all those who want death will try it. And death will be your answer. Because nothing and no power today can stop the rise of the black man. And I want you to know the rise of the red man. I'm very full. I have so much to say to you. I know it's impossible to say it today or tomorrow or the next day, but if I were you, I would not miss these meetings because I don't know how long that I will be among you, but for the time that Allah has me among you, you would be wise to pay attention because if he ever takes me from you, I feel sorry for what will happen to you. You are stiff-necked, hard-hearted, 
and rebellious people, but the end of your stiff-necked rebelliousness has come. You either will submit or you will be killed outright. You are not going to get away from God. He's after you today, black man and woman, and you are coming whether you want to or not. You are on your way. Now, beloved, when I understood by the grace of Allah that that wheel was with me and that in some awesome way my movement was connected to the wheel, and that I and that we are connected to that wheel. And on that wheel is the great Mahdi, Master Farad Muhammad, and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, whether you take it or let it alone. And that wheel represents that which your scriptures refers to as a city coming down from heaven, a new Jerusalem. You know, cities don't come down out of the sky. But when I was blessed to see that wheel, it is like a city above your heads. And on that wheel is a power bigger than any power in the universe. Just let me talk to you a minute. That's why I'm here to tell you, you don't need weapons, black man and woman. I went among the Indians, and before I went, I sent a message up to them. You do not need weapons. Put the weapons away. You already have the best weapon, God himself. And all you need to do is line up with God and get yourself right with the God. And you got power to make things happen, black man and woman, that would blow your mind. You got power today to make things happen if you come in tune with Almighty God. But you are holding back your own rise by your own foolishness. Beloved, I knew that if I went, the wheel would go with me. And that was sufficient power. That would be sufficient power to stop them. I wanted Allah to manifest this power among the Indians for a very special reason. When we went and got into the Four Corners area of northern uh, Arizona, we showed up in the wee hours of July 4th. We had timed it in accord with that which happened 56 years ago on July 4th, when a very mysterious and powerful man showed up in America, Master Farad Muhammad, to whom praise is due forever, who manifested in North America the great Mahdi in 1930, declaring the independence of the black man from white people. Fifty-six years later, in the early morning of July 4th, we manifested among the Indians, declaring not the independence of the Indians, for they are already that, but declaring the union of the black and the red. You may ask yourself, well, Farrakhan, why would you be among the Indians? They are not our people. Master Farad Muhammad, the great Mahdi, when he was in our presence, and Mahdi is an Arab word which means the self-guided one, or one who comes to guide to the right path. And if you behold our movements, you can tell if you are objective that somebody is guiding us that is bigger than we are. The fact that I was able to get back in the country without their seeing me, yet they were looking for me and had alerted every airport and every seaport to be aware that I was on my way. Think about that. And yet when I got here, they didn't see me didn't know I was here, right up under their nose. I'm not bragging. 
What I'm telling America is your plans didn't work. And God wants to show you that anything you plan against me, it's really against yourself. So plan on. As I told you in my homecoming speech, plan whatever you want to plan, then double it. Plan whatever you plan, then triple it and quadruple it. And when it's all over, by the grace of God, I will be left standing like Moses and Aaron, watching Pharaoh and his army drown in a sea of blood and revolution and war. Take it or let it alone. I think Mr. Reagan would be well advised to send some of your aides to sit down and talk if you don't want to come yourself because I'm not coming to you. <laughs> this day God has placed me above you. I am not your slave. You will recognize this servant of Almighty God as Pharaoh was forced to recognize Joseph. Let's move on. Up among the Indians, we prayed, we fasted, as you prayed and fasted. You did not know that we had decided, four of us, it came to me that I should go by myself and not take any of you with me because I knew what I'm prepared to do, but I don't know what anybody else is prepared to do. I am born to give my life for the resurrection of our people and for the union of the black and the red and the oppressed peoples of the earth. I'm born to do that. So when a man is born to do what he is born to do, and he does what he's born to do. He can't ask of you unless you commit yourself. If you are ready to stand up and to give your life for a cause that's bigger than your life, then that's your commitment. I've made mine. And I'm not asking anybody for your commitment. That's up to you. So it was revealed to me to go by myself. And to take just those who are committed with me to give their lives. Immediately, Sister Tynetta Muhammad said, I'm going. Immediately, my wife, Sister Khadija Muhammad said, I'm going. And Brother Jabril came later, and when we told him, he said, I'm going. So the four of us decided we would go and I said, we are not to go in the fringe. We are to go right to the front line. Wherever death is, we go right there. Challenge death. Challenge it. Because death has no power today over the force of life that is with us. <laughs> I know some of you say that man has bugged completely out. <laughs> He's been away too long. <laughs> He went overseas and went crazy. <laughs> you watch me. <laughs> if you think I bugged out, get onto the sideline and just watch the show. It's the greatest show on earth. <laughs> it's the life of Jesus all over again. There's so much in the few little things I'm saying, I, I don't have time to break everything down, but you know, you take it and deal with it. Now, while among the Indians, we prayed and fasted. I ask you to pray and fast. And I thank you so much, those of you that fasted those four or five days. I'm sure you felt something in that prayer and in that fasting, even if you did one day or two days or whatever you were able to do. Thank you for that fast and those prayers. They helped. What I wanted you to see is that there is a power in prayer. 
And there is a power in fasting that is bigger than the little weapons of war that America has amassed and is still amassing to defend what she cannot defend. She cannot defend her right to exist on this earth one minute after the time has been decreed. Unless America changes, guns will not change America. More bombs and bombers will not change America. Her own religious people are warning America that she is going the way of all the ancient wicked powers that went before her. And unless America changes, she's through yeah. as a power in the world. She is steadily on the decline now. Her fall is taking place even as I speak to you. Yeah. She knows it. And when she tells you, it, you won't be in a position to be prepared for the fall because she's such a deceiver. She's keeping this from the people. But she is already falling down. You can check your fall, America. You still have a little time. But you can't check it with weapons. And you can't check it by attacking me and calling me a nut. Because before you can call me crazy, these wheels will be seen all over America. All over America. They're coming down over the major cities. So you won't be able to say it's swamp gas or little lights and people were drunk. They'll be down over Chicago. They'll be down over New York. You will look up one day and see them, and I don't want you to be terrified. They're your friends, black man. Not from outer space. Not from nobody on Mars or Jupiter or Uranus. There are planes flown by the original people. People whose wisdom is far superior to all the scientists of this world. We had a wisdom before the white man was a thought that was superior to his wisdom in its fullness. He's just a little baby. And that plane is a sign of that greater wisdom. They can't touch it. They can't knock it down. There's no rocket that you got that can reach it because there are those on that plane who like Jesus. If you read the scripture, Jesus knew his enemies thinking. He knew their plans and when they were planning, Jesus would always be somewhere else. Jesus, that power, that power that Jesus had is on the wheel. And some of us are growing into that power even now as we speak. wonderful that God would choose a crazy foolish people like us to manifest himself to the whole world who has been talking about God longing for God looking for God hoping for God and never believed and would would believe that God would manifest himself among a dead and foolish people like we all praise is due to Allah now beloved brothers and sisters while we were in this big mountain we prayed a very special prayer since there are 114 surahs to this Quran which if you divide six into 114 you get six times 19. 19 is a code number that is revealed in the 74th surah of the Quran in the 30th verse. So in the 30th verse, you get the number 19 and it says that, you know, hell has 19 angels over hell, 19. This number 19 is a very significant and the secret number found in the Quran. So there in the 74th surah, which is a surah that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad gave me to study before he departed, 
you get also if it's in the 30th verse and the number 19, the parable of 19 comes up there, you get the number 1930. Mm. And 1930 is when the great Mahdi manifested himself in America and his identity was a secret. Yeah. Under the number 19, you get a secret. The 19th chapter of the Quran, I think, is called Maryam, is that right? right, right. Yeah. And the secret in that number 19 or Mariam is the father and the baby yes. a baby Jesus is born and there's a mother but nobody knows who the father is yes. it's a baby manifest from a woman but the father is unseen do you understand so it's there's a lot a big secret around the man Jesus in fact Jesus is the key figure of both the Bible and the Quran and in the life of Jesus is a secret that when it is manifested the whole world will shake and reverberate from the manifestation of the Jesus he's a man a human being but so powerful he's a man born of a woman but he grows up into the wisdom and power of God even though in the Muslim world we do not worship no one, any force, any power but God. And we don't recognize God having any partners or any equals. Yet Jesus is a very special and exalted human being that resembles Adam. And Adam was created by God to be his vicegerent on earth before his fall. Jesus comes up at the end of the world as one created similar to Adam and endowed with powers like Adam, crowned with wisdom, that he becomes an executor of the power of the Most High God in the heavens and in the earth. Yet he's a man born of a woman. This you're going to have to uh, understand and believe me if you will keep tuned and listen and study all of this will be made known to you I am talking to the pastors the preachers you are on the right track Reverend you just don't have the right thought about Jesus you talk about him but you really don't know him you talk about him but you don't trust him that's why you don't have courage to step out like you see me doing. See, but I know the man that you talk about. And that's part of the secret. And I am raised by him to uncover the secret so that we all can lock into this power that Jesus has locked into. <laughs> And I prove to you that I must know him. Come on, brother minister, go ahead. Because when people hear what I have to say, their eyes open. Go ahead. Go ahead. When people hear what I have to say, their ears open. They may be dumb before they hear me speak, but after they hear even a tape and they never saw my face, they begin speaking again with strength. Go ahead, brother. You see a dead people coming to life again from a word coming out of my mouth. And you see the forces who have ruled this world afraid of this little brother and what is coming out of my yeah, mouth. That's right. But they haven't found a way to destroy me yet. Yeah. They're working on it. But I would say with a joy, you know, you're working on your own destruction. Yeah. Because I'm born to glorify him. So even if you take me before your courts, I'll go. I won't even open my mouth. You don't put me on no stand. You're not big enough to judge me. All of you devils put together. No. I'm God's servant. Well, why are you suing? If you don't want the business in court, I just want to prove something to my poor black people who believe in you. 
I want to prove who you are. And even if I win in the Supreme Court, which I believe I will, <laughs> it will show the deceitfulness of government. That they take away the rights of the American people with lies and deceit and trickery. Your day is over. I'll fight you to the end. <laughs> And I will win. That's what's so beautiful about it. God, God has raised up a little black boy who was born into this world in love with his people and hurting deep down in my soul for what you did to us. And I never knew that God would choose me to bring you to your well-bought doom, but I'm here now. And I, I'm ready for the battle. <laughs> and I'm calling you out for war. <clears throat> you are finished. The black man is on his way up. Never to fall down again. The secret to your rise is the unveiling of Jesus. The secret to your rise is to understand Jesus. Same way with the whole Muslim world. The Muslim world is awaiting the return of Jesus. Jesus is the only prophet that the Quran and the sayings of Muhammad bear witness will come back again. Not even the beloved Muhammad is to come back again. But Jesus, they look for him. And they look for Jesus and the Mahdi to appear together at the end of the world. You're just looking in the wrong place, Muslims. <laughs> oh, it's so sweet. They want to keep you dumb to what's going on in your midst. You know I'm just like you. I'm your little brother. I don't manifest anything different from you. But you know that there has to be a power with me. I'm born baptized in the very spirit of God himself. Otherwise, I couldn't do what I'm doing. The book tells you not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. What is holding me up is the spirit of God. What makes me successful is the spirit of God. What is it that makes you to fall in love with Farrakhan and you don't even know him? It's the spirit of God. The government frightened is the spirit of God. They've been looking for somebody like this. Well, you don't have to look anymore. He's here now. You got to deal with him now. Come on, brother. And he's not a baby like he used to be. He's still a baby in one sense, but he's not what you could get rid of. <laughs> God hid him. That's part of the secret, too. Come on. Come on. Come on. We prayed in Big Mountain, a special prayer, 19 units or rachas. And in praying these 19 rachas, we formed a circle, not facing the Kaaba. Listen carefully. Muslims, don't call me a disbeliever, just listen. <laughs> One of us faced east, the other face west. One face north, one face south. Just as it is in Mecca, the Kaaba or the Al Bayt Allah is in the center, and the Muslims are all around the Kaaba, not facing east, but facing the Kaaba, which means they face all directions. Go ahead. Go ahead. So if you remove the Kaaba, which is a symbol of God, Go ahead and you make God the center of your life, you don't have to face east. Because God is in the center of all directions. He's the center of the universe and its order. The sun is not the center of the universe. It is just near the center. But the center of the universe is God himself. 
And when you make God and God alone the center of your life and your activity, then you begin to revolve around him. And as we began to make our rakas, standing, bowing, prostrating, sitting, with our eyes closed, we found that we were moving with the earth. We started on our prayer rugs. And as we ended 19 rock hours later, we had moved from east, from west to east, or from right to left, or from left to right, pardon me, as the movement of the earth. Showing you that when you get in harmony with the universe and its order and the God of creation, you revolve around him, even as the planets revolve around the sun. And this is why you make circuits around the Kaaba. It is something much more profound than even the Muslim scholars understand, but it is for us to reveal it to you today. And you must listen and become awakened by the power of Master Farad Muhammad, who is among the lost found nation of Islam. When we finished praying, the power was so strong just with four of us praying in the Arabic, saying no prophet's name, recognizing only God alone to make sure that our worship was not to any deity, any being, other than the creator of the heavens and the earth. Think of this now. We didn't mention Jesus' name because there would be no Jesus if there were not God himself. We didn't mention Muhammad's name because there would be no Muhammad. And since God told us not to make any distinction between the prophets, we can't mention Muhammad and not Jesus and Abraham and all of the prophets. Because we are commanded by Allah to make no distinction among his servants. All of them are his servants. And he gave them degrees of wisdom to manifest. But God and God alone is the object of worship. And there is no partner that he has. He has nothing in between him. You don't need to worship Jesus. You worship the God that Jesus worshiped. You don't worship the Messiah. You don't worship the Mahdi. You worship Allah alone. So the Quran says to Jesus on the day of judgment that God would ask him, did you tell the people to take your mother and you for gods beside me? And Jesus will answer saying, if I had, you surely would have known it. For I know not what is in your mind, but you know what is in mine. I told them only what you commanded me. Worship my Lord and your Lord. Jesus never told you to worship him. He told you worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And when you worship Jesus, you are guilty of setting up a God beside God. And there is no God but he who originated the heavens and the earth. Reverend, you will get power immediately if you worship God alone. You cannot make Jesus the equal of God. Say, well, the scripture says. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Hey, you better be careful of what people write in and add in to scripture. How can Jesus be equal with his creator? And if the creator gives him power over the heavens and the earth, he didn't take it himself, it was given to him. And if the lamb, which is in the book of Revelations, which you style as the Jesus, or is the Jesus, walks up to him that sat on the throne and takes a book out of the, the man's hand and begins to open the seals thereof. Remember, he didn't write the book. He just took a book. 
So he who wrote the book is better than he who took the book. He who, who teaches one to have control of heavenly powers is greater than he who now exercises control. And he only exercises it by the permission of him who has created the power. So Jesus is to show you your own powers that you are born to evolve into a godly being with power on earth. But if you worship Jesus, you do a disservice to yourself. If you worship Muhammad, you do a disservice to yourself. If you worship Elijah Muhammad, you do a disservice to yourself. If you worship Mahdi, you do a disservice to yourself. Worship Allah alone, not the manifestation of his power. So, after the prayer was over, it came to me, we don't have to pray like this anymore because the prayer had already been answered. I asked for the will to manifest itself. I asked for God to display his power in the will for the people there to see it. And after we made the prayer, it came to me, you don't have to pray no more. In fact, you don't have to fast anymore. Your prayer is answered. I mentioned this to Brother Jabril, and he said, mm, that thought came to me, but I was ashamed to say it. We mentioned it to Sister Tanetta Muhammad. She said, mm, it came to me too. I mentioned it to my wife. She said, yes, I felt the same thing. It's over. But I wouldn't call back and tell you not to fast because the fasting and the praying was good for you to make you to know the kind of power that exists with black people. If we would come back to God and clean up our lives, you don't need a gun no more. You can make it rain. You can make it hail. You can make it snow. You can make earthquakes if you come back to God because he wants to give you that power today. Go ahead. This is what is meant when Paul says you are joint heirs. Heirs. Not A-I-R-S, but H-E-I-R-S. As, what has God bequeathed to you? The same thing that he bequeathed to Adam. When Adam fell, he lost it. It is power, brothers and sisters, to control the destiny of things. This is uh, God's domain on earth. He gives it over to you to rule. Man to rule. And man, white man, has done a very bad job, so he's taking him out of the power. And he's giving the power to you now, if you are willing to accept it and become a righteous executor of that power. This is what is meant by going to the right hand of God. It don't mean you sit at his right, but that right hand is the hand of execution of the power of the mind of God. We are coming into that kind of power to execute power from the mind of God. <laughs> Beloved, this is wonderful. I'm going to, I'm so excited, you know. I'm so full. I just want to tell you that when we started to do the second series of 19 Rakas, a wind came up, almost blew our tents down. Strong wind, and then rain fell. It hadn't rained up there in a long time. Said rain so hard in four hours, there were over four to five inches of rain that fell in that area, and the meteorologist said it was unusual weather because some unusual people were in the valley unusual people had contacted the unusual power of God manifest through the Mahdi. And then that night, 
When it was time for Salatul Maghrib, as the sun was setting, we looked up and saw a bright orange object in the sky. I said, there it is. And all of us, the Muslims, came out and looked. There were five Muslims from Phoenix who had gone up to set up the camp for us. And they came out and they looked and there it was. And as it began, it was in the southeastern sky. As it got darker and darker, this object began to dance for us. We got our binoculars and peeped at it. And it was changing colors, red and green. And it's true. Yellow. And it was going up and down and right and left. And when it got real dark, real dark, the wheel began to just dip and dip backward and then come on back and dip again. We knew we weren't looking at a star. We told the Indians, check it. And I told the chief, I said, this is the power that I want you to know is with us today, chief. You don't have to fear the white man taking your land. God has come to give it all back to you if you come back to him. Y'all all right? Can I have a few more minutes of your time? You that are on the broadcast, I know it's about time to end the broadcast, but I, I, you can get the tape. You can get the tape. And all the Caucasians that are in the audience, you send for this tape. Because there's something I'm going to say about you. I won't be able to put it on the radio, but I want you to hear it. In fact, I'm going to make a tape for whites only. Listen. And I want... And the first person I'm sending it to is Mr. Reagan because I want him to understand who he is, where he is in the book, and what his future is and is not if he don't submit to God today. For whites only. The white man needs to know why he's in the condition that he's in. I'm sorry I don't have time to put it on the radio because I really wanted you to hear it, but it is for whites only. But I'm going to drop a little something on the blacks only that are here. And I don't say this in mockery because I believe that white people should know themselves. And this is what we are here to do. Teach the, the knowledge of self to the whole human family that you may know who you are, what makes you what you are, and under what power were you brought into existence and by whose permission you are here. And if you want to continue into existence, what you got to do. So you be clear, and I'll be clear of you, white people, and all the rest of you, that I've done my job. Yeah. That when he said you have one more thing to do, and then you can come and be with me, as the wheel followed me out of northern Arizona down to southern Arizona, I looked up at the wheel this evening and just smiled because I knew who was on it. And I smiled inwardly saying, I'll be seeing you soon, hopefully. <laughs> oh, you say, oh, that nigga is out of his mind. Shoot. But before you can call me a nut, you will see it. And then you say, man. It's real. And you that mock the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, you will never mock him again. Go ahead, go ahead. Your time of mocking that great beloved brother of ours is all over. That man that Almighty God has chosen to be the father of our nation, the father and the cornerstone of a kingdom of righteousness that will never be removed from the earth. You will have to recognize that father. That's right. And white people, since you love repudiation so much, you're going to have to repudiate your father, but I first must tell you about him. And after I tell you about your father and what he made you to do and why your time is up to do what he made you to do, then I will present you with a different father. 
And if you want to exist, then you have to die and be born again. And I don't mean going to church and have a Christian experience and come out talking about you were born again and you're the same devil that you were before you had this experience. Oh, no. No, no, no. You're not a born again racist. You can't be a born again racist. When you're born again and baptized into the spirit of Almighty God, you don't see race anymore. And you haven't been baptized in that yet. Because there's a certain fire that must come to your mind to burn up the thought of your father in your mind. And that fire is with us today. And unless you've been exposed to what we teach, you haven't been born again yet. <laughs> Well, beloved, I guess it's time for this broadcast to end, but we're still on the case. If you give me a few more minutes, I'm not finished yet. Yes, sir. Y'all all right? <laughs> Those of you who are in the listening audience, call right now, 994-5775, for your tape of today's broadcast. And if you have a moment and you're in the neighborhood of 734 West 79th Street, do drop in and get some more of this wonderful truth from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Thank you so much for listening. And as the audience applauds and the, and the broadcast goes off, we are going to roll right on. And to be the will of Allah next week, same time, same station, keep tuned. May God bless and keep all of you in our listening audience. Thank you very much. Call that number, 994-5775. That's 994-5775. As we came down toward Phoenix, the wheel followed me. We got into Phoenix. I looked up. There it was. And to give a witness, you didn't hear this on the news here, but it, one of the little ones came down out of the sky and chased a woman and her little family in their car in Phoenix going to Las Vegas, Nevada. Oh, sir. And, you know, she got so terrified, she called the police, everybody. And it was the front page news in Phoenix. Yes. That's right. A sister of mine was very spiritual. When she kept hearing them talking about the wheel, she said, I know brothers in town. <laughs> and sure enough, she got a call. <laughs> she said, brother's here. Well, I'm here in Chicago now. I didn't check to see whether it's here, but I know it's here. And it'll be with me wherever I go. And that's in your scripture. I didn't know it in the scripture, but while I was in Burkina Faso, the very vision that I had or that God gave me in Mexico is found in the ninth and 10th chapter of Ezekiel, where Ezekiel is given a vision of the wheel and some mischief making yeah. that some powers were about to get into. And everywhere the son of man went, the wheel went with it. Well, I'm not that great son of man, but I'm one of them. And I'm very fortunate by the grace of God to be in that kind of position connected to the throne of God. This is why in the Quran, Pharaoh wanted to ask his construction engineer to build a tower into the sky that he may check out the God of Moses and Aaron. Yes. Well, who told him that God was in the sky? See, you keep saying the man upstairs. What you mean upstairs? Huh? <laughs> You must be able to make the distinction between Allah manifesting in a man and the God who created the heavens and the earth. You must be able to make the distinction to understand that men are born and men die, but Allah is ever living. So the flesh and the blood of any human being cannot be worshipped. 
because it is finite. You understand? Yes. It is uh, the housing that Allah allows us to have and his spirit can dwell in this house if we permit it and manifest through this house if we permit it. But if you worship the house, you are in error because you cannot worship that which is finite. You can only worship that which is eternal. Do you understand? Yes. So flesh and blood will pass away. It has to. That's the nature of it. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? And this is why the originator of the heavens, you don't get no picture of him. And that's why when Moses taught the people, he said, make no image, no graven image. And don't bow down to any image because any image or any likeness is not God. Did you hear me? If Master Farad Muhammad were to walk in the room, you see flesh, but you don't see the reality of what that flesh contains because that you cannot see with these eyes. I have had out of the body experiences. Now don't, and I'm not off, brothers and sisters. I'm not. I, I, don't, I don't want you to think that the boy is a nut now. Master Farad Muhammad would have walked in the room. You see flesh, but you don't see the reality of what that flesh contains. Because that you cannot see with these eyes. I have had out of the body experiences. Now don't, and I'm not off, brothers and sisters. I'm not. I, I, don't, I don't want you to think that the boy is a nut now. But I have traveled. This is true. This is true as I'm looking at you travel and seen places that I've never been before and my eyes was back in my bed. Yes, and I've heard people talking and my ears were back in my bed. So you don't hear with these ears, nor do you see with these eyes. Your, your ears give you limited sight or a limited hearing and your eyes give you limited vision, only that which comes within the sphere of your eyes. To be able to focus on it by the light enables you to see it physically. So your physical sight is limited, your physical hearing is limited. But there's another ability to see, and there's another ability to hear, that even though these physical eyes do not see it, yet the mind is able to vision and perceive and pick up sound and form and color. Yeah, it's true. Some of you, in fact, all of you, all of you in this room, you ain't strange to what I'm saying because every one of you have had dreams. Some dreams are, you're foolish, but there are others that are very real, where you actually see color, hear sound, and visit places, and then go someplace and say, I've been here before. How many of you have had that kind of experience? All praise is due to Allah. But what does that show you? It is this, brother. This is the power. This is the place where God will live if you will let him come in. That's what the scripture said. He knocks. And whosoever will open up under him, he will come in and sup with you. He will stay with you. He will abide with you. And lo, I will be with you forever, even to the end of the world. This is your scripture. But you got to let the spirit of God, the wisdom of God come in. You got to open up your ears. You got to empty the vessel out of the filth and garbage of the world. And this is why prayer and fasting and eating the right foods is absolutely necessary to bring you back to your original powers. You are a powerful human being. You're not that dumb, dizzy, dead, Negro, nigger, colored boy, coon, shine, and ham bone. You are the people of Almighty God, and you just have to recognize. Look, wait a minute.
every night can other people get wealthy telling you things that you already know. I'm not going to tell you, believe in me, and I got power to save. Just let me put my hands on you. <laughs> Though I do have that kind of power. It's true. But I don't have it and you don't. That's the problem. See, you've got to have an object that you believe in more than yourself, then you can walk when you don't think you can walk. You can throw away your cane when you don't think you could throw it, but you need an object to believe in. I say believe in the one God. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Believe in the originator of the heavens and the earth, and he already has in you a built-in hospital. You didn't hear me. You got within you a built-in fountain of youth. You just have never tapped it. You wonder why Farrakhan getting older yet getting younger. Man took my blood pressure the other day, he said, just like a teenager, I said, shut your mouth. Hey. You sick because you want to be. You don't want to be sick. Stop eating the wrong kind of foods. Stop thinking the wrong kind of thoughts. Put your mind on the power that originated the heavens and the earth because you're from that power. And let that tap into that power and you will regenerate yourself like a battery that's tied into the solar energy of the sun. You tied into God and his spirit. There's no age in God's spirit. This is why I can come up here tired and old, but when I get to going, I start getting younger and younger right in front of your face because the Spirit of God has no age to it. It is limitless. I, I said I wasn't going to get excited today. I said I was going to try and be cool. But I can't help it. Brother and sister, but you know something? The things that I'm saying, even if you've never heard it before, you already know it. And all I'm saying is something that you've been thinking. If it's not in your conscious mind, it's in your subconscious mind. You know that there's more to you than what you have been told. And you don't need preachers. You don't need people just to take your money. You know, and, and you looking at the preacher as though he got a power that you don't have. God didn't fix it like that. He fixed you with power too. And any good teacher, and I say this to all of you who will teach, don't try to make slaves of the people of God. They've been slaves long enough. Don't try to get them to look to you as though you and I are more than what they are and have the potential to become. Your and my job is just to serve. Serve the people into their potential because when they realize their potential, they'll do the thing for themselves that they've been looking to preachers and you can never do for them what they can do for themselves. Now I'm going to end this lecture, okay? I, I, I have to stop. But there's so much that I have to say. Ain't no use in, excuse me, there is no use. There ain't no use. There, there is no use <laughs> in, my, in my trying to say it all today. Because you can only absorb so much and, and then, you know, it gets kind of t uh, tiring and burdensome to you. But let me say this. This great man, Master Farad Muhammad, the Mahdi, he was born in 1877, February the 26th. Now, you know, if he was born in that year, then you know that he's not the originator of the heavens and the earth. So when you say your prayer, you say, surely I've turned myself to thee, O Allah. Huh? Yeah. Trying to be upright to him, who originated the heavens and the earth. So you're not thinking of a man born in 1877. You're thinking of the being that originated creation. Though Master Farad Muhammad has grown into that kind of knowledge 
by the permission of the originator. He comes into it. You understand? Yes, sir. He is a God. A great God and a mighty God. And He's assigned to you and me of the power that is in man if man submits. This man that is on scene today got juice. He is heavy. I mean, he said that the white man is so insignificant to him that he wouldn't trouble himself with the white man. Just so insignificant. He said to prove what he has come into the knowledge of, he'll take a slave. Right out from the foot of the white man and give him power to destroy his civilization. And that's the whole messianic mission. To raise one man from among a people that are no people at all and give him juice and make him a judge. And that's the story of the Jesus. Born of a woman, a natural human being, suffered all the vicissitudes of life, but he overcomes and he overcomes and he finally has a, ba a battle with death and he overcomes death and then he's resurrected and ascended. Don't look at it spookily. Resurrected only means he, he takes he, it in the form of a human being and he suffers at the hands of his enemies and then God brings him back from what appears to be death. But he didn't die. He didn't die. He did not die. If you read the Bible, it didn't tell you he died. The Bible uses the term dead and buried. But when he was on that cross, he prayed to the Father. Go and read it. And he prayed to the Father that the Father would hear his cry and spare him. And the scripture says the Father heard his prayer. Heard his prayer. That means I hear you. And I will deliver you from this. But you just go through it. And by going through that, I am glorified. Because when you go through death, and then conquer that force, then in conquering the force that appears to have overcome you, I am glorified in your going through it. I know it's painful, but go through it anyway. I say this to the Hebrew Israelites, and I say this to the membership of the nation of Islam. You're going through something now that's like a death. It's painful, it's awful suffering, but go through it, because how else can God be glorified? You got to go through it. I got to go through it. I'm ready, man. I, I, I'm, I'm like a horse in the stall. You know what I mean? Can't wait. Can't wait for the gate to be open. I want them to come get me. Because I just want God to show them his power. I don't have none. But whatsoever he allowed me to do is what I do. But I don't have no juice on my own. But if they lay their hands on me, and they'll be so happy, I can see the Jews rejoicing. We got him now. Hell you do. <laughs> you don't have me. <laughs> you may read the paper, they arrested Farrakhan. Hey, it's going to be a, a new day to everybody. <laughs> oh, yes, sir. And the jail will rejoice. <laughs> they say, our man is here. I said, I heard they got our man. They better not. You know how they're going to say it. <laughs> better not mess with the ministry. Right. Right. And in the streets, the streets will be talking. Yeah. Come on and arrest me. <laughs> do what you want to do with me. I'm here for you. And all you jive time hypocrites that hang around. I don't dislike you. I just dislike the way you think. But there's something coming to you, brothers, sisters.
just like it was with Yakub. They'll arrest a few and they'll fill up the jails and they'll be all out in the street. Stuff will be happening. And they'll have to come and make a deal. And let's make a deal with him. The old leadership is finished. With the masses of the people, the people don't want them no more. The people are tired of faggots. Any homosexual in the, in the audience, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about our faggot leadership. I'm talking about leaders that don't really care for the people. People are through with them. And if they don't straighten up, the people are going to kill them. They're just sick of it. I don't say that you should harm them. I don't think you should. You know? Because you cannot do to anybody what God can do. In fact, I want all of you to get killing out of your mind. You talk killing people too much. It's true. When you don't like somebody, the first thing come in your mind, I'll kill that nigga. I'll off that nigga. Somebody leave the kingdom or leave the nation and act a fool, I'll kill that nigga. Nigga ought to be killed. You just shut up. Cut that foolishness out. They ain't your people. The hell right, you got to kill people you didn't produce. Keep your damn hands off these people. If they don't attack you, leave them alone. You scared of them or something? The hell can they say to hurt the kingdom of God? Unless you don't believe. If you're in the kingdom and don't believe you're in the kingdom, that's a different story. I don't give a damn what nobody say. You can't hurt God's work with your mouth. As long as nobody attack you physically, leave your people alone. Stop talking about killing your people. The most ignorant of them may turn out to be better than you. The most wicked of them may turn out to be better than you who think you're so righteous. Malcolm should never have been killed. No, he should not have been killed. God permitted it. But it's wrong, brother and sister, for any of you to think about taking your people's life. You didn't create it. You show that you're a disbeliever in the God. If any one of you rebel against me and go out and speak evil against me and whatnot, I don't pay you no attention. People come to me, I think so-and-so ought to be killed. I said, for what? What you gonna kill him for? Something he's saying that's upsetting you? Well, he talking about you. Well, if he's talking about me, then I should be the one upset. <laughs> and if I'm not upset, what right are you to be upset? <laughs> I love our people, brother and sister. I hate to see funerals. People have done me wrong, still do it. That's on you, that ain't on me. But I don't think anyone should go take another human being's life that can be redeemed. Yes. You don't have that right. However, however, however. <laughs> now see, when you rape a little 14-year-old girl <laughs> and kill that child who had a right to live, then you should die. I don't believe in feeding your rusty behind in no damn jail. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. See, there's a difference here. Yeah. Yeah. Because when people offend you, go against principles of righteousness and decency speak against and work against a divine teacher. That's one thing. Because we know if God is in it, they can't affect that work. But to go and take a little 14-year-old girl who has a right to live and rape her and kill her and then 
you just get a little time in jail and then say you met God and you got converted, see, you know, you will meet him fast. That's right. See, your people got a right to live. You do not have a right to sell death to your people for profit. You don't have a right to sell crack. Because you're killing your people in the name of their ignorance. See? This is why Lenny Bias is dead now. Lenny Bias is dead as an example to you. That he is a beautiful, strong, magnificent brother of ours, God-fearing, about to be super successful, and somebody says, see, this, this nigga's going to the top, and he's going to make a lot of money, and if we can expose him to this, we'll tie right on into the big money that this cat is making. So the moment you see a rose, look for the weed that's there to choke the rose out. See? But at the proper time, God separated the wheat from the tear and burnt that weed that would choke his rose or choke the wheat. There's coming a time, and it's not too far away, when those of you that love to kill your people will be killed outright. We will not have no mercy on you because you have called for death by what you do to your people. Do you hear me? That's coming. We don't build prison houses. We don't build no jails. No jails. You reform in the streets. You reform in your homes, but we in the nation are not building no prisons for righteous people to pay for your rehabilitation. We will rehabilitate you overnight. That's the other side of that. But for you to go out and take judgment into your own hands is wrong. Because most of us who judge don't have a complete knowledge of facts. And we judge so superficially. This is why judgment is put in the hand of one who has been trained by God to do it. And that's not me and it's certainly not you. Is that clear? Yes. Now I can end this. Beloved, why am I now among the Indians? Why? And is this in harmony with what Allah wishes? Or is this some personal, selfish thing that the minister is involved in? Let us go to the student enrollment, which every one of you have to study and recite before you can become a member of the Nation of Islam. And the student enrollment is called Rules of Islam. And a rule is a guiding principle. Since the old world of Islam is gradually dying of a natural death, and a new world of Islam is coming up, there are guiding principles for the new world of Islam that are contained in the student enrollment. Since the Honorable Elijah Muhammad answered lesson number one, student enrollment questions and answers were given by Master Farad Muhammad. But in lesson number one and lesson number two, these are lessons that we were given to study as our assignment, these lessons were answered by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad when he was a baby in the knowledge. And he said, and it is written there, 
These answers are very near correct. Well, then, see, if you take a test and your answer is very near correct, you still fail. Because <laughs> in mathematics, if the answer is 9 and you get 8.999, you were very near there, but you didn't make it, so that's called a failed answer. On, you didn't hear me. <laughs> but we are made to study the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's answers to the first term examination assignment of Elijah Muhammad so that you may at least come into the course that he came into, but you must understand that his answers were very near correct. And if he could answer those questions now, 40 years or nearly 45 years after he answered those, he would answer them so different it would make you and my head spin because he matured in the knowledge. And he told me, and many of you may have heard him say, that if he could answer the lessons now, he could write volumes on just the simple questions that he was asked by Master Farad Muhammad, his teacher. So that means that we must go back over the lessons. We must go back over the teachings. And God will reveal to us not answers that are very near correct, but he will reveal to us very precise answers because the nation of Islam is all wise and does everything right and exact and not very near correct. And if it is very near correct, it failed. And that's why the nation fell because it was very near correct, but it wasn't. You hear what I'm saying? But if the nation is never to fall again, then it must be on a basis that is not very near correct, but correct, mathematically precise. Yes. And you have to go right back to the God and get precise with Him. Because in Him is the precision. In Him is the mathematics. In Him is the correctness. And when we get a correct relationship with Him, then perfection can flow. Yes. You see that? Yes, sir. You know, beloved, y'all got a couple of minutes? Y'all yes, all right? Yes, sir. Look, you know, you know how you say God in baby language? Come on. You know how you say God in baby language? Mama. Mama is God. Wait a minute now. You say... Some people ask the question, is God a female? Mm-hmm. My mama was. That was God to me. I don't know about you, but I believe I'm right. When you came from your mother's womb, you didn't call on the supreme creator of the universe. You didn't know he existed. You came out afraid and you cried, and that was your prayer. And the mighty God put someone right there out of his beneficence and mercy to answer your cry. And that one is called mama. Yeah. And when you cried, she took you to her breast and comforted you. And when you were hungry, she put her breast in your mouth out of the beneficence and mercy of a merciful creator. And you fed from that breast. Oh, yeah. And you became strong. And when you became afraid, you would say, mama. You didn't say Allah. You didn't say Jesus. You didn't say Muhammad, you said mama. God don't fault you for calling mama because mama was his representative. Mama was his agent. But when you mature, if you worship the agent rather than him who gave you the agent, then you become wrong. You understand? Yes, sir. Go ahead. You grow, and as you grow, you see fault in mama. You say, oh, mama's beautiful, but gee, I, I thought mama knew everything. <laughs> I find out mama, you know, don't know everything. I'm so grateful for mama. 
You should never disrespect your mother. Right. Never, 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 never disrespect your mama. I don't care what your mama is. That's your mama. And you must honor and respect her. I don't care what your father is. You must honor and respect your fathers. Because without mama and father as agents of the creative process of the God, you don't come into existence. So if you smack your mama, that's like smacking God. You smack your daddy, that's like smacking God. Because you would have nothing that you have of life if mama wasn't there and if daddy wasn't there. You say, well, my daddy's a drunkard. I don't care what he is. That's the agency that God used to produce sperm that was the essence of your life and you ought to be grateful. Do you understand? It's very important, beloved, that on this level you understand that your parents are agents of the creative power of the God himself. You understand? He put in the nature of man a natural inclination to a woman. You didn't do it. The Creator did it. But it must be regulated. It must be controlled. It must not be a filthy thing, you see? He put in the nature of woman an inclination to the man. So when you get a certain age, the power of sex begins to grow in you. But it's a growth and a power that you experiment with, but it's a power that needs regulation. It needs control. It must not be your God. It must not overpower your development. You must develop ahead of the power of sex to be able to control the power of sex. And this is why God gives you parents to watch the children as this power develops because they may not be able to handle it. You must guard them against themselves. Are you understanding me? When a woman falls in love with a man, that ain't you. That's God working in you. Because he created love and compassion between the male and the female. And when you say, I love you, basically, when you say that, it is your recognition of something valuable in this human being that God has placed there. And you are recognizing God, but you are loving an object that manifests his love. Listen now. Do you hear what I'm saying? But you are gradually growing up out of idolatry. But you first must see a physical thing and you fall in love with a physical thing and you must be moved by a physical thing that you can touch and feel and and have a relationship with but then you don't stop there you must evolve until you don't need the physical anymore because God is not necessarily only on a physical plane he's on another level too you hear what I'm saying oh can you prove for sure you dear sisters, I, I, I say this with so much love and respect for you because you all been through a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. But what you've been through, sisters, is to bring you closer to a reality that is not on a physical plane because men don't necessarily satisfy you anymore on a physical plane. It's very hard, dear brothers. But you will only be able to meet your woman again and rejoice in her again when you find God in your life and God quickens the divine power of himself in you. Then you meet her again on another plane because the plane that you meet her on is a plane that is so fleeting and so limited. If you meet her on the physical plane and please her on the physical plane in a matter of uh, days or hours or weeks or months, you get tired of her and she tires of you. So there must be an elevation in our relationship. And that is not physical. It is spiritual. You all all right? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, So... What I'm suggesting, uh, dear brothers and and sisters, is that 
you worship a physical thing. And God does not hold that against you because it's part of the growth. Abraham was the beloved of God. And yet Abraham went out and saw a star and he began to worship it. He said, this is my God. And then he saw the star set. He saw the moon set. Then he saw the sun set. And he said, oh no, none of these can I worship. <laughs> See, but look how he grew. But yet he's a friend of God all the way along. He's growing. Then he says, ah, I can only bow down to the power that produces these. Then he said, there is no God but Allah. And I'm the first of those who submit. Isn't that wonderful? Well, look now, when Master Farad Muhammad appeared among us, there is no doubt in my mind that that majestic human being is the most magnificent human being on earth. How do I know that? I know that by what he produced. He produced a man in three and a half years. How many can you produce like that? How, look, now, you go to college and you study four years and you get a BS degree. And that's about what it is. <laughs> I don't mean that in vulgarity of Bachelor of Science, of course. But a bachelor. And no bachelor is complete. <laughs> call yourself a bachelor, you, you're automatically not whole. Because right. God didn't make you to be a monk. You have to complete the cycle. You must find a woman, brother. And all of you who have this homosexual tendency, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. Listen, listen. I, I, brothers and sisters, I want to say this. Don't condemn people who have an area of sin that you are not guilty of, but you as sure as heck guilty in another so you feel well I'm not a homosexual so I'm better than him or her but you a fornicator or an adulterer or a drunkard or a thief or a dope seller so don't don't throw off on somebody else because your area of sin is not what theirs is Jesus said if you offend one law you have offended them all so ain't none of us any better than the other okay but those of us who are leaning toward homosexuality are involved in it. You know, there's a reason for it, brother and sister. And I'm not getting into that tonight. That's a whole subject that I would like to talk on one day and just teach the origin of this and how you can come out of it if you're in it. Because you should come out of it. Because these sisters are suffering from the lack of men. And then we got men that don't want to be men. Now, that's a drag. You are helping to foster the imbalance. Can you imagine? Can you imagine a sister seeing a fine-looking man saying, Ooh, I sure like that man. And get up close and say, She's, Hello, baby. <laughs> baby. <laughs> I mean, that sister, that sister want to commit suicide. No, you don't. No, you don't. No, you don't want to commit no suicide. I, I heard uh, Gladys Knight last night sing, I will survive. Yeah. And you will survive, sister. I don't care how hard it gets. You will survive. But your joy now has come on a spiritual level. That's why, the, that's why women are filled in the church. Ain't too many men in there, but the church is full of women. Because women can't find manifestation, fulfillment on a physical plane. So they go to church, and even though Jesus is a man, they don't know him physically. They only know Jesus spiritually. And he satisfies their soul spiritually, see, waiting for you to grow up spiritually and physically so she can say like Mary said when God said to Mary according to the Quran you know that you will bring forth a child and she says how can I have a child when no man has touched me and Allah said it's easy 
All I have to say is be. And it is. And the Spirit of God appeared unto Mary in the form of a well-made man. Not just a man, but he was well-made. <laughs> See, because right now she's in the spirit and she's floating. She ain't grounded. She needs God's spirit in a well-made man. And so you got to hurry and get made again by God so you can build that family again, which is the source of strength of us as a people. And I say all of that to say that Master Farad Muhammad made a man in three and a half years that to me, brother and sister, I don't worship the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, but I love him so, so very, very much. Because without that agent, I could not have been nur nurtured into what I'm becoming. So I must be grateful to God for this agent of my growth. But if I bow down and worship this agent of my growth, if I did it in my infancy, God would still bless me because I'm a child. Yes. But Paul said, when I was a child, I spoke like one. I acted like one. I behaved like one because I thought like one. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. That's right. That's right. And you must put away the worship of finite beings and worship the infinite. Otherwise, you let yourself in for disappointment. Though Master Farad Muhammad is the great Mahdi and God has uh, grown him into powers, that are greater than any human being that has been in existence. Still, he's a man, he was born, and he will die. So that's why you don't see an image nowhere of him. Now, I want to be Elijah Muhammad, never put his image up in a mosque. And he really didn't care if you didn't have his picture. Because he don't want you bind down worshiping flesh because it's what is in the flesh that the flesh cannot contain that when the flesh goes that essence remains <laughs> master farad muhammad to whom praise is due forever and when we say praise we honor and praise him for the work that he did because that's a work that is done under the name of God, Muhammad. And it means one worthy of praise and one praise much. And the scriptures of the Bible said it's been a long time since there has been praise for a holy one. O-N-E. Holy one. Master Farad Muhammad was a holy man who came to North America to awaken us. But... In the rules of Islam that he gave us, I'm going to close at this point, in question number three, he asked the question, what is the population of the original nation in the wilderness of North America and all over the planet Earth? And he gave the answer at that writing. The answer is 17 million. What, what else? Wait, 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 wait. Don't, 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 don't be sloppy with words. 17 million. What's the next word? With the two million Indians. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to say that again. 17 million with. With. What does with mean? Oh, really? If you with me, what does that mean? Yes. You're not only in togetherness, you're in agreement. Yes. And agreement means accord, harmony, unity, oneness. oneness. <laughs> with the two million Indians, making a total of what? 
19 million in the wilderness of North America, 4 billion, 400 million all over the planet Earth. There's that number 19. That means there's a secret there somewhere. <laughs> Now, you know when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was among us, and I hear the son of our beloved leader and teacher in the audience, I hear his voice. I have not seen his face, but I hear his voice. He knows that when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was among us, he used to talk about the Indians. And at a certain point, when he moved to Phoenix and set up the property there, there was a little home that Louis Jordan once lived in that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad bought but he told certain ones that from that house he would deal with the Indians. And there were several chiefs of the Hopi, Navajo, and other Indians that met with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And he wrote articles in the paper about the Indians, just drop things out there. Now I just say this, and we go home today, but we're going to continue this subject Wednesday night. I'll be right back. I ain't leaving you again for a long time. I, 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 I'm so thankful for you because I thought maybe you would begin to think I don't love you. That I'm always here and gone. You know, so I have to spend time because we have to make corrections on everything and everybody because our people are ready and we are not. We are not ready to receive them though they are ready to come. Yes. You see? Yes, so we got to make these corrections to get ourselves ready because the time is at hand. Yes, now, beloved, look. Oh, God, where was I? Yes, yes. So if the 17 million are joined with the 2 million Indians, making a total of 19 million, is telling you in the number 17, in the number 2, and in the number 3, which is the question and answer, there's a lot of secret knowledge there that has to be understood. First, the unity is not going to take place except under a trial. That's why it's number 3. And any time you bring people together who have been separated for long periods of time, there's always a trial in that coming together. Even when you, sister, find a man that you think you love or you find a woman that you think you love, you don't know what it is until you come together with the party. And when that with takes place, that's when trials take place also. And before you know it, the marriage is being rocked, the unity is being rocked. And you say, oh, hell, I'll get this up. But you may give up a good marriage because you're too hasty to divorce because you want everything in a fairy tale manner. You have a fairy tale mentality about life. There is no with that does not mean a trial. All with, all together, all harmony, all accord, all unity is based on a trial. Did you hear me? Yes, Just us coming together as black folk, that's a trial. Yes. We can't come together with each other we, except we want to be tried. I'm tried by you, you tried by me. You say, I don't like that nigga. <laughs> like the way that nigga cut his hair. Nigga, nigga didn't smile at me this morning. <laughs> nigga didn't do this, nigga didn't do that. And you find every excuse to break apart from each other. This is why most of you, you only have a little small circle of friends. And they're not even real friends. They're just a circle of people that you hang with. You have a bottle of wine together, a reefer together, a little party together. But really, you can't trust nobody that you're with because you're not trustworthy yourself. Because in order to be with somebody, you got to undergo trial. And when you come through the trial, the with gets stronger. So you have 17 million with the two men. And in every with, there's a secret. Husbands and wives have secrets. Worst 
thing is when they keep them from each other. <laughs> and that's why Samson said when he killed the Philistine, you know, had you not plowed with my heifer, you would not have learned the secret of my riddle. Because the woman held the secret, but she divulged it to the enemy of her husband. You understand? I'm not getting too, too further into that. We got a lot of work to do on all these lessons. A lot of work to do. But look, 17 million with the 2 million Indians. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us that the Indians rebelled against God 16,000 years ago and were exiled to this part of the earth. Did you know you were a rebel too? Do you think you're catching all this hell because you're righteous? <laughs> I mean, have you thought about it? Say, God, you know, we must have done something at some point in time. Why God just put it on us like this? And you did. See, but the Honorable Elijah Muhammad didn't want to talk too much on that because you were not strong enough at that time to accept the fact that you were worthy of what happened to you. Maybe you're strong enough now to accept the fact that your whipping is because you and I were a part of a rebellion against God. Your nose, your lips, your hair is a manifestation of rebellion. Yeah. I know the Honorable Elijah Muhammad told you that black is beautiful, but now let's deal with reality. Come on, brother. Black is beautiful, but rebellion is up. And he said, God don't like us. And when you rebel against God, in your rebellion, there's the seed of real ugliness. And rebellion starts manifesting itself in your eyes, in your face, in your character. You begin to get uglier and uglier. Don't care what the outside looks like, the inside is rotting away with rebellion against God. One day I wrote the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and I was angry with God. And I couldn't tell nobody but him. So I told him I hated the scientists. He told us there were 24 of them. I said, I hate all of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I couldn't tell nobody else. If I'm a hypocrite, I want him to know it first. So he can protect me against myself. Because I'm a fool, you know. So I said, I hate every one of them. Because... Our father Shabazz rebelled and they didn't send us nobody and we down in the jungle just messing ourselves up, cutting our face, putting discs in our lips, elongating our heads. I mean brothers and sisters we've been messed up. I mean I'm not mocking Africa. I'm not mocking the Isles of the Pacific, but that's the result of rebellion against God. You got black people on this earth who don't look like you and reject you. You're not only rejected of white people, you are rejected of all people. Nobody, everywhere I went in the world, don't nobody love this kinky headed thick-lipped, broad-nosed black person. And if God didn't love you, you threw. Because everybody walks on the black man. Look now. And don't think us mixing with a few white folks, getting a little brighter in the skin or a little curl in the hair or a little less thickness in the lip or nose has made us any better in the eyes of the world. You just a nigga and the world don't love you. Nobody loves you. And the American black man is the most hated of all black people on the earth. Don't nobody want you. I mean, it has been that way. It's changing now. 
but you the most hated of all. Yes, sir. Your brothers in the West Indies and sisters, they see you as worse than themselves. This is true. Any of my West Indian brothers and sisters are here, you know what I'm talking about. Because you come up from the islands, and in a few days, you got a little money, you got a home, you moving out. Here's a black man been here all these years complaining, and you say, what's wrong with him? Same spirit of the southern black brother and sister. They come up north, brother born in the north, he look at them, this brother come up from Bigfoot country. All of a sudden, a person come up from Alabama and Mississippi shot by you like a rocket. Yes, sir. Because under oppression, they've learned that they have to go get it for themselves. And they come up and get it. And now Chicago is the most progressive city for black people anywhere in the world. And it's because Chicago is peopled by mostly people from the South, from Alabama and Mississippi. I mean, Sippy. the backwoods of Georgia and you know suffering and you come on up and you get it together. Is that right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Beloved uh, brother and sister, everybody turns their back on you. Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, other Africans, blacker than you, hair kinkier than yours. Nose broader than yours. You don't see them associating with you. In fact, you stink in the nostrils of civilized people. No, nobody want to be with you because you don't really have no love for yourself or nobody else. But this is a result of rebellion. When I came to the army like Muhammad, I said, Dear Pastor, he said, Don't you ever write me no letter like that and send it through my secretaries. They're not able to handle what, what you put in that letter. You talk that direct to me. And I say, well, I, I'm just angry with them, dear apostle, because 50,000 years is a long time to leave us out of the light. Mm. And then the Honorable Elijah Muhammad looked at me and said, brother, Allah didn't send you out there. He said, when our father rebelled, he justified in coming after you. Mm. You went out there and stay out. Mm. And that's the way the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was by his son, Imam Wadi Fadim. When he went out, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad almost turned his back completely. I didn't send you out there. You went out there. Yes. And when you go out there and you start suffering and they start whooping your behind, he still don't turn mercifully to you. He just wait on you to come back submissive. Yes. Because rebellion is ugly. Yes. Rebellion against the way of God is ugly. And God is not justified in coming after you when you rebel against him. He'll leave you out there generation after generation wallowing in the mud and filth of your rebellion. And then, out of his mercy, he will turn back to you because you are like a whore. Or you are a whore. Or we are whores. Excuse that language. But let me tell you something, brother. When a man loves a woman and give that woman everything that that woman needs, and then he come home and find her giving herself to another man, I mean, there's something in him. He goes berserk. He kill both of them. And then want to kill more because he ain't satisfied. <laughs> I mean, stab her till ain't not this life is out of her, but cut her up, the truth, drag her down the street in pieces. I mean, people just go crazy like that. That's the truth. How do you think God feels? See, the scripture says in the Bible it calls him a jealous God. Yes. Oh yes. I brought you up, Israel. When you were in bondage to Pharaoh, I brought you up. I made you a power right in the midst of Pharaoh. I delivered you out of the wilderness, I mean, out of Egypt into the wilderness, and I delivered you in the wilderness. And yet, when my servant went away, you forgot everything I taught you and went back into the muck and the mire and the mud, you rebellious whore. Yeah. 
and my jealous God. Yes. Oh, yes. I brought you up, Israel. When you were in bondage to Pharaoh, I brought you up. Yes. Come on, come on. I made you a power right in the midst of Pharaoh. I delivered you out of the wilderness, I mean, out of Egypt into the wilderness, and I delivered you in the wilderness. And yet, when my servant went away, you forgot everything I taught you and went back into the muck and the mire and the mud, you rebellious whore. Yes. I turned my back on you. And when God turned his back on you, it's like turning away the light of, of, of his inspiration from you. And you start wandering and becoming lower and lower and filthier and filthier and funkier and funkier and more low down. And you begin to see the west part of yourself manifest because you are a rebel against God. And he don't have to turn back to you. And out of his mercy and love, he may send someone to turn you back toward him. That he may once again turn back towards you. And the same thing that happened to you, black man, for your rebellion 50,000 years ago. And my rebellion, which has earned us the disrespect of the whole planet Earth and being trampled upon by all. And there's nothing that you own that is sacred. Africa was taken from you. Yes. And wherever you live on the earth, you don't own it no more. You are vagabond in your own home because you are rebel against God. That's why you catching hell. You can blame the white man, but he only kicked your backside to kick you back into the favor of God. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I know it hurts. See, Elijah Muhammad couldn't tell you this then. Because it's hard to justify what the white man did to you. But God permitted the white man to kick us, to burn us. To, to, to use the fire of his wicked nature to purify us and bring us back so we could become yes. supreme servants of God after our fall. We are Adam that rebelled and fell. And you don't have your original powers anymore. And when Master Farad Muhammad appeared among us, a man clothed in the original powers, then naturally we bow down because that man is superior to all human beings on the earth. And since we never knew God, it is right that we bow to this that became a father to us. And Elijah Muhammad, who became a mother to us, but they were growing us that we would bow down to none but Allah, the originator of the heavens and the earth. It's wonderful. So, beloved, the Indians have experienced the same thing. 16,000 years ago, they rebelled. Now look at them. Tribes. All over the North America, little tribes and little nations. The language is confused. They can't talk to each other in the tribal language. They're the same people. From here all the way to Central America, all the way to South America, the white man kicked their behind, excuse me, from North America, Canada, down into Central America, killed them all out of the Caribbean. Indians, your people, they are original people just like you, but they rebel and they lost their original powers. So at some point, God is going to turn mercifully to us. And this is why you say in your prayer, Surely I have turned myself to be, oh Allah. But you don't turn on your own. There's got to be somebody to help you turn back to God. And that's what Elijah was. He was an axis around which we could turn the children's heart back to the father and the father's heart back to the children. Do you hear what I'm saying? I couldn't turn back to God except I had a power turning me. None of us turn back on our own. Without Elijah Muhammad, I wouldn't have turned toward the light of Master Farad Muhammad to turn all the way to the originator of the heavens and the earth. 
but I'm turning now. And as you turn back to God, he turns back to you. Yeah. And all of a sudden, a change comes over you. Your heart changes. Your, your mind changes. You become a new individual because the stench and the curse of your rebellion is being removed. The Indians have that curse of rebellion on them, and you and I have it on us, and God made another rebel beat the both of us. Yaqub was a rebel. I'm not going to go into it. Just drop it on you. You think about it. Yaqub made the white man, brought him right on out of us, and you cannot deny that the white man is a new man on our earth. He did not come from Mother Earth. That is why he don't respect the Mother Earth. That's right. He came from another human being. And he does not respect the human being that he was grafted from. But even though he was an evil uh, influence, yet there's a good that's coming out of it. But you see, it takes maturity to see good and evil. And if you say it before time, you think someone has rebelled against the word of God. Look at this flag here. No, 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 sit there. See that crescent? Yes, yes. What is it on? I put it like this. Hold it up, dear brother. That crescent is in its first part. Hold it straight out. Let him see, right. Now that moon, that's in the flag of the universe. When you look up at night, you look for the moon. Yes. It's a beautiful thing. Yes. But when it was created or made, the maker of that had an ugly thought in his mind. Look at this now. You didn't hear me. If the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said 66 trillion years ago, a man, a scientist, wanted to get all the people of the earth to speak one dialect, and because he couldn't do it, he decided to destroy the totality of the planet. So he drilled a hole into the then called moon and filled it with high explosives up to two thirds of it and set it off. And that setting off of the earth splitting. You got a part over here that's called moon and another part called earth and the moon lost its water to this part. And everything on that part called moon died. But it was that death and that destruction that cause good to come up because now the moon equalizes the waters of the earth because the moon is trying to get back the water that she lost. And now the moon is a means of reckoning. You reckon time by the moon and your cycle by the moon. Yes. So that which started off with an evil design from an evil scientist Yet God's supreme goodness overrode the evil, and he permitted the evil to bring about a greater good. So what am I saying by that? The white man was made for evil purposes. But out of the evil that he was made for, something good is going to come out of it. And so, beloved, the time has come that the Indians and the blacks now struggle to find unity. And when you say Indians, you mean the Mexicans, because they're really Indians too. Just the white man has influenced them with his European culture, and they call themselves Mexicans or Chicanos or whatnot, but they're all the same people. And at the root of the Mexicans is the old Mex civilization, which is black civilization. Yes. Right. You got it? Yes, sir. And so I leave you, beloved, saying that the trial that brought about the unity is deep on many levels, but they were facing death up there. And the leader of the Indians did not want me to come because he did not want the responsibility of my being killed among the Indians if the whites decided to attack on the 6th of July as they had said. He sent a message to me not to come, but I had given my word. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us that your word should be born, and you should strive to make your word born. I know we don't always do it because we're weak, but we must strive to make our word born or don't give it. 
And each of us in some way have given our word and failed on it. And when we fail to live up to our word, we breach conduct between the two, two people. And we begin to rupture good, uh, what could be good relations. And if we break our word with God, we'll break our word with man. So I went. And the night before we were to go on the line to face whatever the enemy was going to bring, I went to the Indian chief and I brought him a little packet of tobacco. This is what you do with the chiefs. And I requested for him and I to go into the sweat lodge together. Sweat lodge called the Anipi is something like a womb. I told you about it before. But they just heat rocks till the rocks are hot. And they put the rocks in a hole in the earth and they put wood, bend the wood in, in several directions and they put canvas over this so that no air and no light can get in. You crawl in, then they put the canvas down where there's no light and no air, but the air that's already in there and you got heated stones. Then they pour water on the stones and the heat gets so unbearable in there. I mean, it's like death. In fact, you think you're gonna die. You go in there, macho, you come out something else. <laughs> Cause there is no macho in the womb. And I went in on the third round, third. The brothers who were with me went in for two rounds and on the third round, I was to go in by myself with the chief. I had been in there before and it was a tough experience to stay in that environment for an hour and a half. I thought I was gonna die and I probably did. I mean, that's, that's some experience, brother and sister. And I went in there this time. There were 14 rocks already there from the two rounds before. And he said, brother, I don't think it's necessary to bring the other 14 rocks in. He said, I'll just bring one more in because this rock just split before you came in. And in the splitting of this rock, it means that we don't have to go through the same kind of... Uh, rigorous uh, thing. And that, that, he didn't use the word rigorous. Then he brought that one rock in. And I mean that rock was glowing. Put it on the other 14 that was still glowing. Then he took some cedar out of a bag and he said, brother, I want you to put the cedar on the rock. Now I know when they put the cedar on the rock before, smoke came up and it frightened me because there already was no air. And then when you put smoke in there, you know what I mean? And, this thing is rough, you know. <laughs> so he gave me a handful of cedar, and I took the cedar, and I spread it on the rock. And when I put it on the rock, instead of smoke coming up, I mean fire came up out of the rock. I mean, just rose up. And he said, brother, that's another sign that uh, power is with you, and therefore we don't have to go through. See, in other words, this is a purification ceremony, you see? We don't have to go through with all that others are going through. Then he said to close the flap down. And when he closed the flap down, he began, he took his drum, and he said, this is a song between you and me. It's a warrior song, Brother Farrakhan, because tomorrow I may die or you may die, or we both may die, but I want this song to be between you and me. It's a death song that every warrior has, that when he sees the hour coming that he may die, he sings this kind of song. So he sang this song in this sweat lodge, and meanwhile, pouring water, water, I mean, pouring water on the rock, and heat is going around and then he's hitting the drum and when you hit the drum on the inside of that womb-like structure, it's like your head is pounding like this because 
you're in a womb. And he sang the song so sweetly. And then he began to pray. And after he prayed, I prayed. And as I prayed for the black and the red, knowing that both of us had rebelled, and that the whites themselves were rebels. And even as we were in this anipi being purified and the heat of the stones were put in, I said, oh Allah, it is like the nature of white people whose hearts are hard against the truth, like stone. And the fire of their temperament has been heated. And the water of your wisdom on a race who is hard against you. They have used their wisdom for evil, but in the evil, they are purifying the black and the red. And that Indian brother said, brother, when he pulled the flap down, you could see the red of that stone glowing among all the others. He said, this is the way it was in the beginning. In the beginning, there was the black and there was the red because all around us was blackness and in the center was the fire of the red. It's tough. And then when I started to pray, and this is, uh, he broke. And I could hear him cry. And at the end of the prayer, in fact, before the prayer ended, he said, Oh, taco api, which means, you know, open the flap. And he said, you can continue your prayer, but it's not necessary to go any further. You know, and when I finished my prayer, he said, brother, as an elder and a chief, I am not allowed to weep in front of the warriors. They must always see me strong. But when we, the elders, are in service like this, we are allowed to show our weakness in the presence of our equals. And he said, you are like that to me. And he said, if I die tomorrow, I feel that there's someone that will carry on. That means that under that trial, in that anipi, a bond between that chief, that medicine man, that spiritual man, and a bond between Farrakhan as a representative of the nation of Islam, the 17 million with the 2 million Indians under trial, and there's yet a secret. And from that point on, I mean, the Indian elders on the land came, and they allowed me to speak on the line. And the elders came and embraced us. And now they want the black and the red to come up. And they want to do business and establish business with the black man. Not thieves and criminals, but righteous men. Yes. And so on Wednesday night, on this coming Wednesday, I want you to come out and hear why the move to Big Mountain could be the most dangerous move that we have made and why the government will be frightened by black and red yes. coming together and what they will attempt to do to drive it apart. When I told Ernie after we came off of that line that I was going to leave, he said, I'm relieved. Because there's nothing more that the enemy would like is that you be killed by an Indian in order to rupture the growing relationship between the black and the red. And so, when we come together, the, the, the lost members of the original nation, there's a power that emanates from the black and the red. And you will see a new America coming up out of this union. And the third party, which is the number one rebel, who was made to purify us, if it pleases Allah, he too can be purified. That's hard for you to take. But that's all in the lessons. But he must be killed. Why does Muhammad and any Muslim murder the devil? 
because he's 100% wicked and will not keep and obey the laws of Islam. He's a snake of the grafted type. Huh? And if he's allowed to live, he will surely sting someone else. It is not that the white man as a physical person can do that kind of harm to you. But the way the white man was taught by his father absolutely makes him an enemy to all humanity and an enemy to himself. And unless that that is in his mind, out of which comes racism, sexism, materialism, greed, avarice, and the destruction of humanity, unless that mind is killed, and unless he accepts to die on the spiritual plane, then he will have to be killed outright on the physical plane. And that's why the Mahdi has come to kill him, to put him to death because his time is up. And I stand between death and his life. And if he or the Jews feel that Farrakhan is such an enemy that they have to get rid of me, then that means that God will absolutely get rid of them. This is their last chance. This is the last trumpet you will hear before you hear the other one from the wheel. Not accident. Earthquake hit California. Six on the Richter scale. Bigger one coming. A lot of death and destruction coming your way. God is after you. You sing the song. I hear him call by the thunder I hear him where? Deep within my soul. I ain't got long to stay here. All of you know this. Ain't one of you in this audience that has not been clocking your own rebellion and the punishment that comes from rebellion. So I say to all of you in the nation of Islam, all of you that have left the nation, Nobody needs to touch you. When you are out in that world, you are out in a world that is called in the scripture the wailing and the gnashing of teeth. And in your rebellion, the world just gnashes on you and, until you start wailing. And when you recognize that it's because you denied something that you should have followed on up on, then all you got to do is turn back to God and come home and your fortune will change. I don't want to call it luck, but your fortune will change when you stop your rebellion and come home to God and you will start becoming a more beautiful person. Every day that you live in obedience to God, you will be more and more beautiful. Thank you for listening. May Allah bless you as I greet you in peace. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Praise be to Allah.